Recording is on. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to start? I'm totally ready to start. That was quite the, in <laughs> the intro from the lady. It loves the robot lady. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it just, it really likes to announce its presence. Um, <laughs> so, hi everyone, and welcome to our virtual discussion of O. Salazar Dubrow's Sisters of Element. Uh, we have O. Salazar Dubrow, or Olivia, here with us today. As a reminder, you can purchase this book at our website at orcabooks.com. Um, I'll put a link in the chat box on left of the screen. It's at the very top, but I'll probably just keep plugging it uh, throughout the event. Um, we also have copies available in store, like this one, if you want to come down to 315 Fifth Avenue Southeast. That's our new location. Uh, let's see. O. Salazar Dubrow grew up in Olympia, Washington, with five younger sisters. An entrepreneur and community leader with a long career in public service, Olivia is also an incurable creative who's inspired her Mexican American heritage by her Amer Mexican American heritage. Her work incorporates her love of family, food, music, and culture. She stayed in Olympia to study, earning a BA in English from the Evergreen State College and still lives there with her husband, her sweetheart of more than 20 years, and their two sons, whom she considers her greatest achievements. So for this, we advise to press the tile view button at the bottom of your screen to see Olivia full screen, if you haven't already. After that, uh, we will be doing a little interview and then we will open it up for audience questions. As you heard by the giant lady from above, we are planning to record the event. So if you don't want to appear on video, please keep your cameras disabled. You can do this at the bottom of your screen. Also, make sure to enter your name and pronouns if you'd like. Please keep your mics muted most of the time. Um, when it is time for questions, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself and ask Olivia your questions. All right, Olivia, I give the floor to you. Hi. <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for letting me be here. Thanks for hosting me. Thanks for inviting me to this. You know, I love Orca and I love Olympia. So I am just really honored to be here and to be able to share my work. So thank you so much, Jonah. Thank you for being um, here. So, yeah, of <laughs> course. <laughs> So um, yeah, so my name is Olivia Salazar de Bro. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm really excited to see so many faces here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out with a little bit of a reading, right? Is that what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one. Ah, something smells amazing, I say as I walk into our family home a one-story moss green craftsman in Percival Falls, Washington. It's the house where we all grew up and where my three younger sisters still live. Wafting from the kitchen to the front door is a tantalizing mixture of savory spices, garlic, onion, chile de arbol, and oregano. It has been simmering all day in one of my family's favorite comfort food dishes and the smell only gets stronger as we follow our noses. Even though it's been a few years since we've moved out of our childhood home, I never miss our weekly family dinners. Because it is amazing, Val shouts back from the kitchen. Gabriel and I grin at each other and bring the flowers and the wine into the kitchen. Though there have been some upgrades to the house to modernize it, the walls are still the canary yellow color our mother painted them when our parents first moved here in the early 80s. My sisters and I discussed painting the kitchen a different color until Val reminded us that mom said she always wanted the kitchen to feel happy. And we had to agree, yellow is a happy color. My sister Val is standing over the stove, dancing and singing to reggaeton with gusto as she stirs a pot of pozole, a spicy pork and hominy group, a soup that isn't just a meal, it's an event. We've learned the hard way that when word gets out that pozole is on the menu, people tend to show up unexpectedly at your house. To prevent a house full of uninvited guests, we only tell the people we really want to come and we swear them to secrecy. Tonight, it was supposed to be just family, but Val invited the mystery boyfriend she's been gushing about for the past several months. Val has invited him to family dinner a few times, but he canceled, citing his work commitments. Tonight seems to be the night that the stars align and we'll finally get to meet him. She's in an especially good mood. Bringing the soup spoon out of the pot, she blows on it gently, then brings it to her lips for a taste. 
Woo, that's what I'm talking about. Damn, I'm good. Val exclaims with fake bravado, laughing at herself. Setting the spoon down, she points her fingers in the direction of the fire underneath the pot, concentrating on the blue flames and shrinking them until they extinguish. Val has the ability to control fire, which comes in handy with her cooking talent. Out of all of my sister's powers, hers has been the most challenging to master because of its destructive nature. As a child, I used my ability to control water to put out a lot of her fires. She eventually learned to hone her gift. She works as a cook at a local pub, but I know that one day she wants to own her own restaurant. She's talked about it for years. Gabriel steps up to kiss me, kiss her on the cheek. Hey sis, are you gonna let me try some? He tries to grab the spoon, but she pushes him back playfully. Just because you're practically my bro doesn't mean you get special privileges. You need to wait. She waves a spoon at him. I love watching him interact with my family. Gabriel and I have been inseparable since our first date almost two years ago. I honestly couldn't imagine my life without him. For the moment we met, I felt whole. Seeing him integrate into our family as if he's always belonged is just one of the million things I adore about him. He loves my sisters like his own, and to them, he's the brother that they never had. The day I trusted Gabriel with our secret was the day that I lifted a huge burden. It felt dishonest keeping a part of myself hidden from him when I loved him so much. Rather than running away or being afraid, he was even more determined to protect not only me, but my family as well. He comes over and kisses my hand, looking at me curiously. Why are you looking at me like that, mi vida? He asks, you, I just love you, I say, and I kiss him. My favorite couple's here. Hey guys, my sister Zoe bounces into the kitchen. She's second to youngest and she's been working as a hairstylist at a local salon with several other friends she's had since cosmetology school. She is the social butterfly of the family, often trying to convince us to go out dancing with her on the weeknights. She has the ability to control wind and air, even learning how to fly. And now that she knows how to fly with others in tow, we use that to our advantage when we need to travel quickly. Conveniently, saves time and gas. She throws her arms around my neck and kisses us both on our cheeks. Gabriel and I give her a tight hug back. Damn, Val, isn't that soup ready yet? I've been waiting all day. She shoots a look, a look over at Val, who seems oblivious to the impatient tone in Zoe's voice. Val is in her own world, singing off key and busting some moves I am not sure I've ever seen her bust before. I can't remember her being this enamored with a guy since middle school. Zoe and I watch Val for a minute, and then we look back at each other, covering our mouths and giggling. Have you met the boyfriend yet? I whisper to her. So shakes her head. No. I caught a quick look out at the window a few times when he dropped her off. He never walks her to the door. He has a nice car, though. She winks at me. Oh, a nice car. Well, in that case, he must be a keeper, I say sarcastically. Zoe snickers. I'm surprised he's actually showing up this time. I think this is like his fifth invitation to family dinner. Poor Val gets her hopes up each time and then he bails last minute. I hope he was worth the wait. The doorbell rings and I hear a loud clang when Val drops a soup spoon into the pozole pot. He's here, Val exclaims as she smooths her clothes down nervously, her voice a couple of octaves higher than it usually is. Rory, get the door! Val yells as she tries to do some last minute sprucing. Coming, Rory says with no sense of urgency as she emerges from what I call her hippie den. I'm not sure what my sister does in her room besides light incense and discover new ways to save the planet. Her ability is connected to the earth so she can control things like stone, dirt, plants, pretty much anything derived from ground. Our baby sister owns the title Granola proudly. She's working on her fine arts degree at the Evergreen State College and I can envision her working as a full-time artist one day. She is that good. Rory shuffles to the door and says loudly, who is it and what are you selling? Rory, open the damn door, cabrona. Val stomps out of the kitchen to give Rory the evil eye. Rory chuckles to herself and unlocks the door. We all wait with anticipation to get a look at this guy that has Val all a flutter. With the fedora hat crooked to the side, he saunters in, dressed from head to toe in black. 
His suit is a few sizes too large, so it drapes lazily on his skinny frame like a sleepy stray cat. He smiles out of one corner of his mouth, the smile not reaching his eyes, which are steely blue and unblinking, almost staring. Holding out a bouquet of bright purple roses and a bottle of Cristal to Rory, he nods towards us in a, greet, in a greeting. Rory seems to be experiencing an aversion to his generous spray of aftershave. She looks at him tentatively, not sure whether to push him out the door or take the flowers. She decides to accept his gifts since she was raised with some manners. Hello, gorgeous. You must be one of Val's sisters. I can see that beauty runs in the family, he says with a half smile as he looks Rory up and down. These roses are special. I know a guy who hand dips them in dye imp imported from Morocco, just for my Latina queen, because purple is for royalty. Thank you. Come in, Val's expecting you. Rory's being polite, but she is clearly disgusted by his synthetically dyed flowers, over the top and inappropriate compliment and his strong smelling cologne. I think she's gonna throw those floral abominations out the second he turns his back, regardless of how expensive they are. Val rushes over and throws her arms around him, planting an enthusiastic and an audible kiss on his lips. He kisses her back hard and then pushes her away and says, Easy, baby, we have company. Let's save that for later. He uses his index finger to bop her on the nose. She beams at him and flutters her long lashes. My sisters and I look at each other, shocked. Normally, if a man tried to bop her on the nose, it would be followed by Val giving him a swift slap to the face. Val realizes we're all staring at her and grabs his hands, pulling him inside the living room. Everyone, this is Jeffrey, he goes by free. Hun, this is my family, and you've already met Rory. She's the baby. And then there's Zoe. Zoe holds out her hand and says, Hi, it's good to finally meet you. I but before she but she gets cut off as Free pulls her in unexpectedly for a bear hug. The force is so strong her head swings back. Her arms are pinned down as she endures his vice grip and winces a little. Sorry, I'm a hugger. Free laughs. Zoe looks a little winded and disoriented. I brace myself because I know I'm next. Crap. This is Lena, the oldest, and her boyfriend, Gabriel. Before Free can hug me or grab me, Gabriel intercepts and lays a big hug on him, causing my sisters and I to burst into giggles. Now it's Free's turn to be surprised, and the look on his face is priceless. Gabriel says, we've been looking forward to meeting you, man. As he lets him go, he gives Free a single swift smack on the back. He grins at me and puts his arm around my shoulders, protecting me. I look at him in, in appreciation, taking a deep breath now that I can relax. He winks and kisses my cheek. My sweetie always has my back. Zoe smiles at us both, knowing that Gabriel's little show was for her too. Free's hat is disheveled and lopsided. Val notices and reaches her hand up to fix it. Right when she does, he grabs her wrist. No, I got it, he snaps. I look at Zoe and Gabriel in a shock, and Gabriel's jaw clenches. For a moment, Val locks eyes with Free until he lets her go and angrily puts his hat back in place. Holding her arm close to her chest, she rubs it gingerly and looks down. When she looks up again, she smiles at him and shrugs her shoulders. She smiles at us and shrugs her shoulders. I forgot. His dad gave him that hat a long time ago. It's very special to him. Biting her lips, she looks back at Free and puts her hand out tentatively on his shoulder. I'm, I'm sorry, babe. The steely expression in his eyes softens and he puts his hand on top of hers. I know, it's fine, he says, kissing the top of her head. Her lips curl up in a smile and she peers up at him through her lashes. Um, the food's gonna get cold, let's eat. Free, I can't wait for you to try it, Val says, trying to lighten the mood. She puts her arm around his waist and they walk into the kitchen with us falling behind. And I think I'll just leave, stop right here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was good. Oh God, I was reading along. Um, okay, thank you for sharing that bit of the book with us. Uh, oh my gosh, I love that. Um, so before we dive deep, um, cause I do have some more deeper questions, but I wanted to, ask you some sort of speed round questions to get you warmed up. So 
It's kind of a game that I've stolen from our last guest host because um, I liked it so much. Um, are you ready? You got five seconds to answer each of these. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Favorite author. Favorite author, Alisa Valdez. Okay. Favorite flavor of ice cream. Mm, mint chocolate chip. Last show you binged. Damn. Oh, oh, uh, uh, Ugly Betty. <laughs> uh, dog or cat? Uh, dog. Okay. Uh, what element would you control? Water. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That was my little surprise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, so I have some questions, some actual questions. Uh, <laughs> so I guess, actually before that, um, could you give us a little brief synopsis about Sisters of Element? We just kind of dived into it. Um, so yeah. besides these great characters, what's this about? That would have been good for me to say before I read the you're, book. You're so Sorry. good. <laughs> <laughs> so Sisters of Element is about four Mexican-American sisters who live in a town called Percival Falls, Washington. Um, and each of them have a special power based on an element. So water, fire, earth, air. Um, and it's told from the perspective of their oldest sister, Val. Um, and she's she's kind of afraid, she's worried. She's worried for her sister Val. She sees that something's going on with her and, and you can see what I read from the first chapter. Um, there's this introduction of Val's boyfriend, Free, who's kind of big trouble. So that's kind of where it starts, um, where um, her sister's spidey senses are kind of heightened and she's like, oh, this guy's this guy bad news. And I think my sister's in trouble and I need to help her. And, and that's kind of where it starts. Yeah. I always hate it when you meet your friends or loved one's new boyfriend or something and you just instantly hate him. <laughs> so, you know, it's hard. It's hard yeah. because you can't be like, break up with them. Yeah. You, you captured that. You captured that feeling. <laughs> then, then they'll be like, no, you suck. You don't tell me anything. I'm in love with him. <laughs> um, so how long did this novel take you to write? And maybe what were some of the inspirations behind it? So it took me actively writing. It was about a, a year and a half from start to finish of actually holding my baby in my hand, you know. Um, and I would say the inspiration behind it, well, I would say, so kind of going back, you know, when I first started writing this book, I was in a really different place. I was kind of writing from a place of grief. I had lost my sister. I had lost other family members really dear to me. And I was almost like kind of wanting to bring them back in a way, like trying to honor them just by, st that, that was the start of it, right? And um, of course it grew into something much more better and beautiful. And these characters became their own characters. But what I really loved is as I was thinking about these characters, I was really inspired by my sisters and our sisterhood. I mean, I'm the oldest of six girls, no boys. And so I was, I was, I was kind of channeling my sisters at the time. And the elements kind of made sense when I thought about their personalities. I was like, oh yeah, that sister, fiery, fiery personality right up in there. You know, like I, it was coming together. Um, so that's how it started. And of course, people have also asked me if the other characters were inspired by people in my life. And that's absolutely yes. Um, I do have a Bella in my life. I do have a Gabriel in my life. Those people that have met my family and know my husband would not question that. They'll be like, mm -hmm. he's Gabriel, for sure. There's, there's no question. <laughs> I had a Mama Joyce in my life. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was definitely people that inspired it, but I also, I'm trying to, you know, I always tell them like, it's inspired by you, but like, you are not Gabriel. So let's get it real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, were there any, um, works of literature that possibly inspired this or maybe other types of media stories? So I, um, I would say that so first of all, these are like the Latina superpower, super superheroes. I was gonna say superpowers, they have superpowers. But these are the Latina superheroes I never had. So I was trying to create that too. Um, but with that said, I mean, I am a huge fan of like um, 
stories with strong female characters. And I would say really movies and, and um, TV, especially like Buffy the Vampire Slayer is my girl. And I just love, I love how people um, underestimate women and then they come out on top and they're like, this is really who I am. Okay. Like I am actually phenomenal. I'm amazing. I'm an Amazon. I'll kick your butt. So um, characters like that, you know, Wonder Woman growing up, um, seeing Linda Carter, I definitely had the underroos and everything. Like I was in, I, I loved her. You know, she was the first time I had seen a, a female superhero. Um, so yeah, like I like, I like superheroes and I like stories about underdogs too. Kind of so rad. <laughs> um, kind of going uh, back into being inspired by real life. Um, I understand that this book setting is partly inspired by Olympia, Washington. Uh, can you tell us what some are the more prominent parts of our town that might come up in this novel? Yeah, so this Percival Falls is very inspired by Washington. I mean, if you think like, so Lena, um, she works at a nonprofit and I was picturing the YW, the YMCA downtown, like the old, the old one. Oh yeah. Uh, she was, there's a scene where she's biking to work and she's kind of seeing the, um, the blossoms, the cherry blossom trees, you know, cause it's fall, they're falling down and she's going to work over to the Y. I mean, I was picturing all these things. And then uh, there's a part where the sisters are hanging out downtown. They go to the Korean restaurant, which is, I mean, hot stone for all you all that live in Olympia. Like that's, mm. I love, yeah, I love hot stone. Um, they go to a bookstore. There's like rainy day and you know, there's like all these things that I'm not actually calling them out, but people that live in Olympia would be like, oh my God, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, and even there's a, like a part where um, Gabriel and Lena are going off to lunch and sitting at a bench by the Hands on Children's Museum and looking out at the bay, you know, you know, like stuff like that. Yes. Cool. <laughs> I, I did see that there was um, the Evergreen State College in here as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I, I am an alum too, so I had to give him a shout out. Hell yeah. Um, and <laughs> And, I, and it's funny because I see a little bit of myself in all of the sisters too. So when they say Rory is the hippie, I'm like, that's what my sisters call me as well. And, you know, <laughs> I, I own that with pride. <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> let's go on. Um, so this was funded, I, uh, I understand, by Indiegogo campaign. Could you tell me what that process was like? Yeah, so, well, first of all, it is an indie, I mean, I'm an indie author, so I had to obviously come up with the funds for my, you know, on my own. So the Indiegogo campaign was really a um, pre-sale campaign where I allowed my family, community folks to, to um, you know, get their hands on the book <laughs> early and also help me recoup some of the costs. So it was really fun, actually. My son helped me um, with the video because, like, you know, I'm I really suck at doing video. I'm just not good at it. So <laughs> the only young kids that know what they're doing do that stuff. Um, and I just talked about the book in a very public way that I hadn't before because up until then, and you know this, Jonah, because you just you just did this too. Yeah. So it's you're working on this thing for a long time and you're in it and you're like really raw and vulnerable for a long time. And then finally you get to the point to where it's almost there and you're like, Oh my God, it's almost like birthing a child. And <laughs> you're afraid people are going to say your child is ugly. Like it's so, <laughs> <laughs> so, <real. laughs> so it's kind of a scary process. Right. So I was like, Oh my gosh, now it's starting to really feel real. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this project and it's coming together and people are going to have the opportunity to, to support me. It's just so crazy. So, um, it was fun, actually. It ended up being a lot of fun and it was exciting too because people, then I allowed people to be excited with me. You know, like I, I allowed for my community to, to support me and, and see this project that I've been working on for so long. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I'd, I'd assume that I'll probably do that again with book two, you know, just with everyone. Um, if, every one of the books that I plan in the series, I'm going to probably end up doing Indiegogo unless I can get a really cool publishing house to like pick me up, which, you know, that'd be cool. But 
I mean, I'm pretty much thinking I'm going to go independent the whole time because I love having the control that comes with that. That's great. I remember being really stressed and anxious for my my campaign. Were you were you anxious at all for that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was crazy anxious. I'm like, and but it wasn't like I was. I think the freedom in it for me was like I had already spent the money, mm -hmm. so it wasn't that I was um anxious about oh my gosh oh my gosh i have to like make sure that i you know make all this money because i'm not going to be able to do it it was like no i already spent the money i'm already in the hole it would be kind of nice to recoup my costs but really what i was trying to do was was just share it with people like now it was like my first chance to kind of de debut it and share with people and all i was really kind of excited about was getting it into people's hands at that point so it was fun and but yeah i agree it was really anxiety ridden times too <laughs> um okay so uh speaking of being independent what advice would you give authors who are looking to go the more diy route what were some things you learned well um gosh i would say that it it's definitely an investment not just financially but like emotionally it is a thing i mean writing a book and i might have said this already but it is like one of the most raw vulnerable things that you can do um so just be invested in and in, in yourself you know and in, in that time set up set up space for yourself to do that work um follow your flow follow your instincts and also don't be afraid to seek out support. Like I sought out support from an amazing author coach who helped me herd all the kitties in my life pretty much because it was nuts. I mean, I was working full time. I had a, a business, you know, I had, um, I started a, a networking group for female entrepreneurs. I mean, there's all these things I was doing at the time that I was writing this book. And so I needed help on just how to, how to make that schedule work, how to still keep this project moving forward, how to not completely drain myself, you know, um, and fill my cup while I was doing all this. So I hired a coach and uh, you know this coach because she awesome. She's, she's, she's friends with all the cool people in, in town. <laughs> Her name's Sage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, hired, I hired Sage Adderley Knox. Uh, and oh my God, she was just a godsend for me. She helped me figure out how to make a schedule for myself, how to keep moving forward, how to like, um, like if I was blocked, what to do, like tools, resources, just everything, motivation, you know, just tell me, yes, girl, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Even that sometimes was just enough. So we cried together on the phone. I mean, she was, she was more than just a coach. She's just, a godsend. So I was, um, I definitely recommend to anybody that's trying to do this to don't feel like you have to do this alone. There, there are support systems out there to help you. So you don't have to struggle so much, you know? So, yeah. I think Sage is having a free workshop soon. I don't know. I think it's might've started this week. Um, and if not, it starts next week. I know it starts on a Monday and it's online. It's called idea to outline. It's, phenomenal and she does it um on facebook so sage adderley knox.com i think is her is her uh, website but yes she's amazing she's amazing okay um my last question and then we'll open it up to the audience why do you think it's important for stories like sisters of element to be told you know it's funny so i've um People have been asking me a lot about representation lately. And I think it has to do with this moment that we're in and how important it is for people of color to be seen. When when I uh, when I initially was writing this book, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about just sharing the story. Um, but it's become so much more than that. Like it's become about rep you know, representation and how important it is for us, you know, especially, you know, people of color, anyone who's marginalized really to be seen, how important it is for those stories to be told. Um, so yeah, I um, I forgot what the original question was, but I think that I was going on about representation, right? <laughs> I was just saying, why is it important? So like, that's it just, Yeah, exactly, that's where I was going. 
just see where it's a representation. And, you know, um, we all have stories. We have all have stories and they're, it's really important for them to be told. That's great. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to open this to the floor. If you want to uh, raise your hand, you can do so. If you just want to, oh, there's somebody. Um, fellow Jitser would like to speak. I don't know who that is, but you can, you're welcome to unmute yourself. If you're shy, you can write in the, the little chat box on the left. I have not been plugging the URL like I said I would. But I will do that right now. Uh, but yeah, a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions here in the chat also. Are there? Yeah. Oh, what is the youngest age you would recommend the book to? So I would say that is that's a good question. I've been telling people it's kind of like if you if your child is cool with watching a PG-13 movie, they're probably cool with reading this book. <laughs> So it kind of depends on the child. I think it, and I say that because, um, you know, they're, they're adults, so they do drink alcohol in the book. I'll just put that out there. And they, you know, they, they curse a little bit. They don't say really bad things, but you know, like PG-13 basically. So maybe middle school age, um, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger, kind of depending if the child can handle it. <laughs> I remember a customer this morning, actually, um, I had this book out on display at the front desk and she pointed to it and she was like, oh my gosh, my niece loves this book like so much. And I was like, really? Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I love that. I've heard from um, a friend who her daughter really loved the book and she's, she's younger. I want to say maybe she's like 12 or 11. But what was so cute about it is she said, and she plays Sisters of Element all the time with her brother. Like one will play Val and the other one will play Lena and they'll be outside, you know, like playing their, with their powers. And, you know, and she loves that she loves that there's these female superheroes. Like I just, that to me was like, oh my God, that's everything. Thank oh you. <laughs> all right, let's see. Hello, Jitser would like to speak. Um, you are welcome to unmute yourself and speak, fellow Jitser. I don't have your name, so go for it. Um, hi, Olivia. It's Therese. It's so hi. nice to hear you. I was having, can you, I was having trouble unmuting. Now? I can hear you. Yeah. Hey, Therese. Great. Um, yeah. I uh, had a question and an ask. Um, I was curious if you mentioned the evergreen bread, the evergreen. And I was curious if there was something you um, studied or support you got during your time there that gave you the confidence to do, um, to go forward with writing a novel, because that's a super task. And I also came in a little late, so I just caught the end of your reading. So I'm hoping you'll read another section of the novel as well. Oh, wow. Thank you, Therese. Um, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I went to Evergreen State College. I did mention that I went there, but I don't think I talked about what I studied. I I was actually in the in um, I was actually trying to get ready for being a teacher. So I was in a you know there's really not any um, what do you call it? Uh, well, it was a focus. I would say it was a focus on English is what I was doing, um, and I after after I graduated with my BA. BA um, I ended up going into, I was into the master's program for a master's of public administration. I didn't end up finishing. However, I did take a really cool, um, English class prior to it. And it was in that class that I actually came up with the idea for this book. We did a, uh, just a, we would do free writing, ex you know, exercises and, like I said, um, you know, at the time I was going through a lot of grief, you know, I was in a grief period, missing my sister and, um, you know, other people in my life that had just passed away. And so there was just, you know, something about doing that that was so therapeutic for me. And then I somehow ended up with this little nugget, which ended up being the, um, what is this, the prologue? It ended up being the prologue in the book. Well, it's really interesting how that started, but yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. And yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank you. 
Olivia, this is uh, Merritt. Um, Merritt, hi. <laughs> Again, uh, congrats. Congratulations and thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your thoughts and to learn more about you and the book. Uh, my question is, um, as a recently published author uh, and going through the writing process of my manuscript, in the beginning, I was pretty narrow in the way I was writing and I have a background in adult corrections and everything there was very explicit, very detailed. So once I was able to unshackle myself with that, I was pretty free in what I was writing and expressing myself. And then there became there came a point in time when I started getting feedback on different vignettes that I had written. I took a writing class and I became very cautious about my writing style and questioning the use of different words uh, and rewriting more so than I had in the past. So I just wanted to ask you if you would be so kind and talk about just your processing and rewriting and when do you finally get to the point of saying, okay, this is where I wanted to be and to move on. Or you just, I, I just, if you could drill down on that, that would be very helpful, I know to me. Yeah, I, I love that you shared your, your process too, Merritt. Um, and I have your book. Yay! <laughs> I have a signed copy of Merritt's book. Um, I would say when I was writing the manuscript, and, and at the time I had my author coach, Sage, was right along the side of me with um, the entire process. And she was just telling me, just, just write, just write, just write. Don't even worry about you know, um, correcting anything, you just need to write, get it all out. And then once that was done, then we went through the process of editing and, you know, read it over again, edit it again. And then, um, then we got to the point to where we were going to have the beta readers read it. And that was honestly like scary, really scary. Because up until that point, I mean, really only I and Sage had laid eyes on it. Right. Um, so that was anxiety <laughs> inducing. But I was like, you know what? I, I just, you know, if I don't just do this, I'm never going to get it published. I'm, you know, I'd be too afraid to put it out into the world. So I have to just rip, rip the bandaid off. Just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then what was so smart about what Sage had me do is she said, okay, so, so while it's out there, well, there's other stuff we can work on. We can work on thinking about, you know, what are your keyword searches or what's the genre that you're going to put this in uh, on Amazon? Like, like, let's think of the marketing. Let's think of all these other mm -hmm. pieces that you could be working mm -hmm. on. So you don't spin your wheels mm -hmm. worried about what the beta readers are going to say. And then once the beta reader fe like feedback came back, woo. That was, that was what you just expressed, where it was very much like that. It was like, I was questioning everything about myself. I was like, I, I'm not gonna get this published because obviously I am awful at this and they hate my book. They want <laughs> to rearrange things. They, they, don't, they don't believe that Gabriel could be a real guy. And they, they want me to take away my, my beginning with the prologue. And so there's all these things. Yeah. And so that's why I was so grateful that I had Sage because she's like, it's, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. Let's talk about this and let's look for patterns. If there's patterns, if someone's saying, if, they're, if all three of them are saying the same thing or some, certain themes are coming up, you know, um, let's address that. But you should stick to your guns. If you love the prologue, because I kept saying, no, 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 the prologue, I love the prologue. Like, I don't want to live. And she's like, no, keep it. If that's what your vision is, keep that. Um, so I'm really grateful that I had her because it's very easy, especially if you're doing it by, you know, on your own, right. to just have to internalize that and just really have it affect your entire body of work that you just did. Um, yeah. So does that answer your question? Oh, no, that's that's perfect. Thank you so much. It's very helpful and very instructive because that's the kind of thing I was going through. I was able to work it through. I had my own sage here, Marsha, 
uh, to help counsel me during that process. But it was definitely a point that you really question yourself. Yeah, I'll bet. And also, Mary, I mean, yours is a memoir. Yours is is even more personal, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I see mm -hmm. why that was such a like, oh, my gosh, kind of moment. Yeah. Thanks again. Of course. Thank you. All right. Um, there are two more questions in the chat right now. Uh, Tambra asks, what did you discover about yourself while going through this this process of writing this book? Mm. This is probably going to sound really esoteric and like hippie, but just that I have power in my words, that I was that I was meant to do this, and that my um, that I needed to share this, that, that this this part of me needed to be shared, and that it's part of it's also a part of healing, not just for me but for others. Um, yeah, I just learned that I, I needed to embrace this part of me and that it was, it's a part of my power, I guess. That's what I, that's what I learned. And also that I can do it. That's another thing that I learned, you know, and, and again, I would say it is kind of like with, with birthing a child, like birthing a child, right? With, with my first one, it was, I don't know, it was like 13 hours or something. And I just remember you get to this point to where you're like, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. I can't, I'm going to die. I can't do this. And somewhere, some way you just find this power. It's like coming from the ancestors. It's like, you, you know, that all the answers that have passed on, they're like holding on to you. They're like, yes, baby, yes, you can. You can totally do that. It's the same with this. It's like, you get, you're like, I, I, I can't, I can't do this. Like, this is, this is too hard. I mean, I actually got to the point to where I had like nothing else to give. I was just so, so raw and so drained. And I remember Sage saying, you know what? You just have to fill your cup. You stop doing everything you're doing. You need to attend to you right now. And, and that's the thing is like you, you get that also from your ancestors, from your divine power, whatever, like you get that, that extra strength that you need, that extra boot. So I, I found that I could do it and and that i was getting help <laughs> from the other side <laughs> i love that <laughs> um okay rosa asks what is your favorite book from elisa valdez the dirty girls social club Ooh, that was fast. Sounds, i know I, have you read it it sounds kind of like ooh, but it's I, actually it's, oh they're like yeah it's <laughs> so good it is so good yeah i um I really connected with that book. I think that was one of the first books I had read where it had like strong Latina characters and it, it talked about them one after another, like in each one's voice. And, um, and it was just so, it was so good. It was so real. And I was like, I know these girls, like I know them. They feel like they're my friends. Like I've known them forever. And that was probably one of the first times that had ever happened for me where I saw Latina characters in a book. It's really weird. And I was an adult when I read it. So it's interesting because I think I, I posted about that the other day about, you know, representation with folks of color and these books. And I had, it, it was really hard for me growing up not seeing Latina literary characters, you know? Um, so anyway, I, yeah, I love that book. And I also like, I think about that when I think about the series in, in the sense that I love that it's told from each character's point of view. So that's kind of how I'm envisioning the rest of the series too. Like I would love for each sister to write each oh, of the different cool. books, you know? Yeah. That'd be good. Um, I just wrote down the dirty girl too. I'm going to add it to our stock uh, after this meeting. So good. <laughs> Stephanie yeah. asks, how many books in your series and how, and how have planned out is everything, hold on, I have to, that. Yeah. Planned out as everything in advance. I see it. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, um, okay, so I have book one now. I'm starting to write book two, or I'm I'm already writing book two. Um, I would love to have four books in the series. You know, if if I'm thinking about one being told in each sister's voice, um, I would love it to go down the line. 
you know, the next one would be Val's book. The next one will be Zoe. Then finally we end with Rory. And I, I do kind of have things um, like a story arc in my head, but it's constantly changing. A lot of my process is really internal. Like it's a lot of just like thinking things through first before I even sit down to start writing. So, yeah. Let's see. Diane wants you to know, do you remember when their signed copy of the book dropped in a lake? <laughs> <laughs> she says that she thinks Lena caused that. <laughs> I remember her telling me that story, and I was like, "Yeah, she probably did." I hope that you enjoyed the book, though. <laughs> Let's see. Um, would you, uh, to round us out, would you round us up with one more little reading from this book? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. I know that I wanted to read a little bit from, okay, here we go. I'm also going to introduce one of my other favorite characters, which is Mama, jo Mama Joyce. A lot of people love Mama Joyce. <sighs> Joyce's office door is open, so I knock on the wall next to the light panel. She's on the phone with what sounds like a vendor for an upcoming fundraiser gala, and she waves me in. I shuffle inside, holding a bag of ice for her back and a small stack of donor letters for her to sign. I love listening to her work her magic on the phone. She has a perfect blend of professionalism, tenacity, and charisma. That's why our community center thrives and grows in capacity to help more families every year. I walk around the office looking at all of the photos and children's artwork on her shelves and her walls. There are photos of Joyce and Vernon with their daughter Sadie and their grandsons, as well as photos of my sisters and I at different ages. One photo catches my eye. It was taken at the center when I was about 12. We are hugging her so tightly that our cheeks are squished. Her eyes are glistening with happy tears. I remember that day. It was the day of the center's talent show and we sang a song we wrote for Joyce. Hold on, I'm gonna need a drink of water because I'm start I'm starting to get choked up already. <laughs> All right. mm. Okay. We sang a song we wrote for Joyce called Never Alone Again. Rory played up a beat, played a beat up guitar our father had left in the garage. Zoe played percussion on some drums we made from tin cans. I played on the center's old off-tune piano and sang lead, and Val sat next to me and sang backup. It was our way to say thank you for always being there for us. My eyes well up at the memory and the way she ran up, ran up and hugged us when we got off stage. Oh, you girls got me so good that day. Mama was ugly crying in front of everybody. Joyce is behind me giving my shoulders a squeeze. I think it's about time for my girls to write me another song, she says with a sentimental chuckle. I look at her and I smile. You want a new song? Nah, maybe not. The old song's perfect. I don't think you could ever top that. She starts humming the melody and rocking with me. I put my head on her shoulder. I show her the bag of ice. Are you still hurting? She stops rocking, remembering her back pain, putting her hand on her lower back. Yes, work your magic, girl. Making sure our, her door is locked and the blinds are drawn. I place my hand in the bag and liquefy all of the, uh, the ice so that it surrounds her hand like a glove. Okay, let me see. Standing up, Joyce turns towards her desk, one hand steadying herself on the desktop and the other pulling up folds of blue and gold fabric to reveal her lower back. As I inspect her skin, I can tell that the left side is slightly swollen and tender. Place, placing both of my hands on her back and starting on the side with the most pain, I move them slowly in a circle, radiating blue light to use the healing, cooling power of the water. With the water as extensions of my fingers, I feel the pockets of knots and tight ligaments. I radiate the healing glow deeper to flow over them, gently erasing the burning pain found there. Joyce visibly relaxes her shoulders down and lets out a deep breath. I can see now how much pain she was holding in her body. Poor thing. Are you gonna pass out on me? I ask over her shoulder. No, baby girl, just feeling the flow. She smiles back, her voice warm and serene. 
I give her a kiss on her cheek and put the water back into shape into a frozen rose. You're all fixed now, I say as I hand it to her. She tilts her head and then places her hand over her heart. She looks at me intently for a moment. Damn it. I'm so getting choked. <laughs> What are you doing to me, Jonah? Got this. <laughs> um, she looks at me intently for a moment, her eyes misting over. I will never forget the day you guys gave me this. You and your sisters, my brave little girls. You survived so much, and you always did it together. She takes her hand off her heart and cups my face with her hand. Like I said back then, you were meant for greatness, every one of you. And I'm going to stop there. Otherwise, I'm going to start crying. Oh my. Tears. Mama's going to start crying ugly tears. <laughs> um, we've had one more bonus question. Last question of the night. Um, Marsha Long wants to know, what has been your sister's reaction to your book? Yeah, they've, um, well, so one of my sisters was here in the beginning and she said she loves me and she's excited for the book. So. <laughs> At least I'm like at least one likes it. No, all of them, all of them have been amazing. They've been incredibly supportive. Um, you know, it's funny. I have the one sister that uh, she she's kind of my muse for Val, and of course Val is very complicated in this book. So she was like a little like you know <laughs> tentative about the book. First, she's like you know, what are you trying to say about me? And I was like, no, it's not about you. It's really, you were inspired it just a little bit, but really, I mean, you know, and also the thing is that Val, you know, all of these sisters, like they are so special and amazing. And yeah, maybe a little bit of them was inspired by my sisters, but I mean, they became their own people. They became their own. They all, you know, had, took on a life of their own. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, I think my sisters have all been really excited and super supportive. And so my my parents That's and funny. my husband too. Of course, he, was, he was a little embarrassed. He's like, what? <laughs> but the funny thing is I'll, I'll share a little bit about my process too. So when I started creating these characters, and of course, like I said, they were a little bit inspired by real people in my life. I also, I had to start creating boards on uh, Pinterest with, you know, pictures so that I did not like think of them as I was writing the book. I really wanted to think of them as different separate characters. So I had someone who's an actor that looks kind of like my husband, but he's not because I, I did not want to picture him kissing some woman, you know, <laughs> I didn't want any of that. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I uh, yeah just a little insight into what my process was in, in creating these characters. <laughs> Julie noted, I will use a Pinterest board next time. That's yeah. good. <laughs> it's good. I actually even printed out the pictures and I had them on an actual, I mean, when I was writing. That is so cool. That's really nice. <laughs> okay, Olivia, it has been such an absolute pleasure. Um, once again, everyone, uh, you can get this book uh, at orcabooks.com or I actually just revamped the liter the local literature section today. So it's gonna be there. It's gonna be pretty good. Um, thank you so much for doing this with us. This was so great. Thank you so much. It's so good to see everybody. I'm waving at all of you. Hi. Oh, it was so good to see so many friendly faces. Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm so honored. All right. I am going to stop recording. Boop, boop, and then it'll